So I'm currently in the process of making a new game review, and as I was trying to gather my thoughts, I stumbled across an old video by Mother's Basement. I have my opinions on Jeff's anime reviews, but I'd like to use this as a way of seeing how I can find different ways of viewing game design. I am going to be skipping around in the video to things that I find the most contention with. The premise of the video is why games like SAO, ALO, and GGO would be bad, so some of his comments on characterization or how the story is written are going to be left out for the sake of brevity. It's abundantly clear that Reki Kawahara doesn't play video games at all, despite having written two light novel series about them. And I mean, you don't need to play games to write stories about them, any more than Andy Weir needed to be an astronaut to write The Martian, but if you don't, you do need to do basic research, and Reki Kawahara can't even be fucking bothered to do that. Jeff brings up that Reki Kawahara lacks research, but if you look up the original web novel for Sword Art Online, you'll know that it was written back in 2002 before even World of Warcraft launched, so the MMORPG market was dominated by Ultima, EverQuest, and PSO. In spite of these examples, he opts to compare it to Warcraft, Warhammer, and Terra instead. When you look at Kawahara's two big series, SAO and Excel World, there's one common thread that links their heroes. Speed. These guys are such great gamers entirely because they have the fastest reflexes, like, ever. But that's not how competitive video games work. That's how writers on shitty daytime TV shows think competitive video games work. Any pro gamer will tell you that while reflexes do matter, the determining factors in winning any game are systems knowledge and your ability to read your opponent. In a shooter, knowing where everything is on the map and figuring out where your enemy will go next is the key to victory, not improving your headshot accuracy. In a fighting game where things move way too fast to react to anyway, the key to winning is figuring out what option your opponent will take next and moving to counter it before it happens. Funnily enough, despite being a sword game, I'd rather compare it to an FPS. Not the Coomer Bait shooters like Overwatch, I'd more aptly compare it to COD, CSGO, or Rainbow Six. Though callouts and game knowledge matter an awful lot, being able to peek a corner or hold a corner better will determine whether you win or not at a high level when everyone has access to the same weapons that can one-tap as you and has access to the same knowledge as you. Not to mention, the appeal of such a game would be the fact that it would be so immersive that being able to use all five senses to assess your environment would have an even greater focus, especially due to it being a tech demo. I also find it funny that he outlines a 60 frame fighting game as something too fast to react to, as opposed to an FPS that would have run well over 100 frames at the time of this video, and has increased dramatically since. There's no fucking way that any of the game's financial backers would sign off on that, for the simple reason that they would never, ever make their money back. World of Warcraft had an estimated budget at launch of $63 million. Now, SAO would probably cost 10 times that much to develop because the graphics are exponentially more detailed than WoW's, the physics engine is a lot more complicated, it has two years worth of content at launch, and on top of regular game development costs, we also have to account for the cost of creating sensory data for every possible interaction in the game, but let's be ultra-conservative and use WoW as a baseline. If developing SAO costs $63 million, then each of those 10,000 players would have to pay $6,300 for the game to break even. You need a whole-ass console to play SAO, on top of the likely inflated price of the game itself. Not to mention, later games use Kaiba's Seed, which is basically a game engine, so Kaiba would have likely gotten royalties from other games using his sensory assets had he not wanted to make the death game. Using the Apple Vision Pro as a reference point, the lowball of 10,000 players would lead to a profit of 34,990,000. Now these are only the show numbers. The book number for active players is 50,000, leading to $174,950,000. And if we look at the wiki to corroborate the Nerve Gear sales, we get 200,000 units sold, something which Jeff mentions but never brings up to account for cost. Even if SAO eventually made it into the hands of every single person who owned a Nerve Gear, at the time of SAO's beta test, that was only somewhere in the ballpark of 200,000. How do I know this and not how to drive? Had he done this, he would have got a minimum of $699,800,000. $63 million. Now, SAO would probably cost 10 times that much to develop. I do think that he is being entirely correct when he says it would probably cost significantly more than Warcraft. But the whole thing of two years in the game worth of stuff at launch neglects to mention that there is a lot of off-screen grinding, which he admits to when he says Kirito has to constantly take damage to level up his healing. This means that it's likely that enemies have been copied and pasted all over the place, not to mention how many times do people die in video games? They're playing overly cautiously, almost as though their life is on the line. This would lead to them taking more time and being more cautious in every single situation, which they would be more reckless in. 
Jeff even tries to make the point later on in the video that if people weren't paranoid about the death game, that they would gain XP at a higher rate than they would otherwise, which is not ever proven throughout the entire show. Considering that MMOs like Warhammer Online have budgets in the hundreds of millions, as do single player games like GTA V, I am being extremely generous with those numbers. He is not being generous at all with those numbers. We don't see a lot of side quests, so the writing staff, the highlight of most big budget games, would be minimal. There's no celebrity voice actors, and again we are working with highly experimental technology as opposed to something like GTA V, a game that is very very mechanically similar to traceable predecessors. And again, the console was not developed by Rockstar. PlayStation VR is projected to hit around 700,000 units by the end of the year, just three months after its launch, while the more expensive HTC Vive and Oculus Rift are expected to hit about 800k combined sales by year's end. Teslas are expensive for what they can do in comparison to normal cars. For example, a 2023 RAV4 is 30k and has more mileage than a 2023 Tesla Model 3, which is 42k. Now, you may be thinking that a 12k gap in money isn't that bad, but this is an apples to apples comparison. The gap between today's neuroscience and being able to fake all five senses effectively with sending microwaves to the brain is massive, so the $3500 estimate will likely be dwarfed by the true price of a real life nerve gear. The issue with this line of thinking is the fact that the Nerve Gear literally has no games other than SAO. It's absolutely BS that anybody bought the Nerve Gear to begin with, and Jeff could easily say that it's a plot hole because of how unbelievable it is, but because he goes with a specific narrative in mind, he has to neglect that evidence. If anything, the Nerve Gear would pop off more after people have gotten their hands on SAO since there would be a game to play on it as opposed to literally nothing for months on end. Not to mention the prospect of being able to spend time with friends from a long distance over the internet and being able to physically interact with them. Think about all the people who get COD games or 2K games year after year just so they can have a fraction of that experience. So the game would never make money, the hardware would never make money, and no investor would ever touch full dive VR with a 10-foot pole ever again. A pretty far cry from the VR-enabled future Reki Kawahara predicts in Excel World. The idea that nobody would ever touch the full dive market again is bullshit. Hoverboards out of all things blew up on release, literally, but One Wheel is still not bankrupt. Not to mention, it would mean that there would be a greater amount of government regulation when it comes to such devices. It would have been fine if he had argued that it would have been outlawed, but a bunch of people are absolutely insane and smart enough to make something dangerous like this work. In terms of actual usability, SAO's menus and graphics are pretty awful. A maze of dropdowns nested within dropdowns nested within dropdowns. Yes, it's minimalistic and elegant and nice to look at, but there's a reason that games like WoW have such cluttered screens. Because you actually need access to all of that information at once. In WoW, if you need something like a potion for battle, you can have it loaded up on your on-screen item box or even tied to a hotkey for easy access. In SAO, to use a potion, you have to open your menu, click on the player icon, click on items in the drop-down menu, then scroll through the drop-down list of items, which you can only read five at a time, in order to find the potion. And in the time it takes you to sort through all those menus, you're probably already dead. Or maybe your party member is, not that you know, because their life bar is squirreled away over in the top left corner of your vision. And even if you notice that a party member is dying, you can't actually see which one it is unless you turn your eyes, not your head, all the way to the periphery to read their name. There is a massive amount of issues with this section, and it's honestly what made me want to make the video. The difference between WoW and SAO is the difference between 1 and 3. SAO is a first person game, so any amount of cluttering in the environments will be insanely intrusive and will inhibit somebody from looking at dangerous things. This is especially infuriating because he complains that the health of party members is nestled at the top left of your vision, arguing that it would be hard to see. In his ideal version of the game, the area would be occupied by items and spells, not to mention other areas in somebody's peripheral vision that would also be occupied by important items and spells. His complaint about hotkeys not existing is insane to me. What fucking keyboard is a player going to press? If you look at the series itself, it already has a hotkey. You have the potion strapped onto your body before the boss fights even starts, and then you physically consume it. Jeff not only shows footage of this happening, but he also talks about it happening in the show, which is absolutely asinine that his point about dropdowns even exists in the video. But let's say you want to have access to every single item at once, or you think that somebody should have access to as many potions as they can carry. If you think that a limit on the amount of consumables one would have access to before they are required to open up a menu is bad game design, then Minecraft must be absolutely awful. Only allowing 9 potions to be equipped at a time. 
In order to equip new gear, you first need to unequip everything you're wearing, right down to the underwear. Now, I realize this is just an excuse to show some more fan service, but think of how fucking awful it would be to have to take that extra step every time you get new equipment in an MMO. He complains about having to take off clothes before you put on new clothes. And you know what the worst part of this is? None of it is even fucking necessary. You're hooked up to a computer that can directly read your goddamn mind. Why do you even need a gesture-based interface in the first place? Having the menu be thought-controlled would be infinitely more straightforward and easier to program. It's like they didn't even think about how they were designing the game. Take off your clothes and trade all of your weapons to me. By processing that sentence, you thought of it. Maybe you even thought of an equipment menu from one of your favorite games. Under Jeff's ideal system, that is apparently easier to program than reading a rig. You will take off all your clothes and you will trade all your weapons to me. The nerve gear is supposed to intercept brain signals that would otherwise go through limbs. Again, we have access to this technology with prosthetics. All the devs have to do is translate that to a rig and have the movements of the rig being tracked to open up a menu. A menu that reads every thought in the brain, irrespective of importance, or whether the signal was meant to be sent to a part of the body or not, will cause people to blurt out the most random shit, make people physically do stupid things that pop into their head, and make them mess with their inventory in ways that they would never do. SAO has one player role, close range DPS. It has characters that it calls tanks, but the only difference between them and attackers is that they block enemy attacks instead of dodging them. He says there's no tanks in the game and sees no difference between blocking and dodging. The point of a tank in the game is to take damage for the party. That is their main purpose. Unlike a DPS, they are forced to take damage in every combat encounter that is on their level. It would be better suited for players with poorer reaction times because having a DPS dodge roll means that they're risking getting a full hit and taking full damage, whereas being a tank means that you're guaranteed to take the hit, but you can mitigate the damage to a large degree. However, SAO has its own spin on this, by allowing you to swap out in the middle of a combat scenario since only one party member can interact with an enemy at a time. This means that during an enemy's startup, instead of having your DPS try and dodge it, you can have a tank try to mitigate the damage. He outlined a supposed holy trinity of class roles in RPGs, being DPS, tanks, and healers. At this point, we see one of the more prevalent issues with this, his focus on SAO's PvP. If we look at the three RPGs that I mentioned came out within the time period, you'll see that one of them doesn't have it at all, and the two that do have servers dedicated to it, as opposed to one mass server. So even assuming that Reki Kawahara did do his research on it, he wouldn't exactly know how people who play games solely for PvP would also interact with people who solely play it for PvE. Almost since their inception, one of the design pillars of MMOs has been the holy trinity of class roles. Tank, healer, and DPS, or damage per second. Tanks absorb the bulk of enemy damage, DPS characters deal the bulk of damage for your party, and healers make sure that everyone else stays alive. If you've played any RPG, you would see the issue with this. It neglects the fact that bards, druids, and especially artificers exist. On top of that, subclassing still exists, meaning that you can spec into blacksmithing as well as food making, which gives buffs to your party. Beast tamers also exist, with their familiars being able to detect enemies and give passive healing, though they are not officially recognized as a class. Again, this game is technologically revolutionary. It would be a shame if it didn't focus on its gimmick of being immersive. Getting a whole headset just to jerk off on the sidelines would make for a very bad investment, considering the price of the nerve gear. Though not explicitly explained in the story, there is a disproportionate amount of people who play DPS instead of tank. It's wishful thinking, but I would assume that in a good story, this demonstrates that most people are not willing to take hits for others because their life is on the line, and they wouldn't want to trust somebody else to not run away. But even DPS players get the shaft with this system. Having no supports means that every player has to constantly worry about their own life bar, which they can't even see half the time, chugging potion after potion just to stay alive, which would get boring fast for anyone who wants to take an aggressive DPS role in combat. It's antithetical to how they want to play. This assumes that a lot of enemy encounters have unavoidable attacks that the player cannot dodge, or AoEs that are hard to avoid. He's complaining about something that would only be a problem if a player were being reckless and intentionally runs into attacks. In short, don't get hit. Never mind what this does to encounter design. With no ranged weapons or magic available and only one role for every single player to fill, every battle needs to revolve around constant attacking. It limits the strategies that both bosses and players can employ, which is, again, boring. Delete I would like an example of an interesting strategy for an action game that doesn't involve a disproportionate amount of attacking. I fail to see how throwing out AoEs and status effects is more engaging than hacking away at something that reads your inputs precisely while the enemy's flesh responds to you physically. 
The game itself would be way more attack focused than any other action RPGs because you can choose the starting and ending lag of attacks. Again, it's based on physical actions. If this game went to market in this state, it would be dead inside a month. Having no way to engage in battle, support players would quit first, likely removing most of the crafters and player vendors from the game, which would in turn fuck the whole in-game trading economy up the ass. And when a game's economy gets fucked, everyone bails. As we see in later full dives, especially GGO, there is an economy for things as benign as skins. People buy weapons for real money because they would rather not grind it for themselves. I would assume that people specializing in support roles like blacksmithing and cooking would be able to hold players by the balls in a similar way. To an even greater degree, because only player characters blacksmithing things can get specific weapons and armor, meaning that players can't entirely rely on vendors. Not to mention that blacksmithing is a subclass instead of the main class, meaning that it won't detract from strength or agility points. So a blacksmith wouldn't just be confined to a very hot room throughout the entire day, they're able to explore dungeons as well. The counter-argument to this is that SAO is an entirely new type of game, that VR changes things to the point that old design paradigms no longer work. This game isn't based around player levels or group composition, it's a test of raw skill and reflex. You can't judge it by conventional standards, Jeff. This is fiction. Stop being such a nerd. Kill yourself. So, did I guess what you were gonna write? The game's main purpose is to show how responsive Full Dive VR is. It is absolutely about reflex and skill, especially taking into consideration that startup and ending lag are determined by your skill. It is the launch title of the most revolutionary game console of all times. Of course it couldn't be judged by conventional standards for video games in general. Not only that, but like I said, MMOs specifically were very limited at the time. The only way that Kawahara could have wrote an accurate portrayal of this is if he time-traveled back into 2002. The fact that he points out that somebody is going to make this argument doesn't make the argument invalid. I can just as easily make the argument that he's going to say SAO is bad because he thinks the characters are bad, that it's not well developed, direction is bad, everything like that. He gives off the illusion of defeating an argument without actually having to engage with it at all. The thing is, we do have a standard by which we can judge games like that. Dark Souls, and to some extent, Monster Hunter. And SAO holds up even worse in comparison to those games. A lot of the variety in games like that comes from different weapon types, and SAO is very limited in that regard. Oh yeah, and he brings up Dark Souls and Monster Hunter, which aren't even first-person games, which SAO is meant to be. Both as good metrics as for what SAO should strive to be like. I haven't played too much Monster Hunter, but I know the entirety of Lothric like the back of my hand. And I can assure you, Jeff has no appreciation for the Souls series, had he even played it. The differences between a tank and a DPS build in Dark Souls is that one blocks and the other dodges. You only have access to a select few equipped items, of which you can only rotate out in one direction by using the D-pad, meaning that if you spam it and you accidentally skip an item, you have to scroll through the whole thing again. Swapping out spells acts in the exact same way. There's also not a lot of variation when it comes to tactics to fight against Dark Souls bosses. Jeff is unknowingly undermining his own criticism by bringing up Dark Souls as a standard which SAO should strive to achieve. From what I can tell, there's no level cap in the game. Players are meant to be grinding for levels straight up through the endgame content, which is terrible enough on its own. So hypothetically, a level 1000 player could run around the starting area ganking noobs with no repercussions. You literally cannot say the level cap thing since they only get to the 74th floor. Not to mention, the difference between a hard and soft cap is not explained, so for all we know, every level up gives you exactly one point of extra damage, just like Dark Souls. A quick Google search will easily disprove him by saying the cardinal system would have made a level cap if it were necessary past floor 74. This is the SAO wiki, a source which he has used before and will use in the video. I do realize that the lack of good world building is in quite a few of my refutations, but again, I don't agree about SAO being a bad series, I just disagree with it being inherently bad as a game. The stuff he said about ganking noobs and spawn is funny to me, since he brought up WoW as an example of a good MMO with a massive budget earlier. It was so fucking big that South Park made an episode on ganking noobs. But you know what's even worse than that? the skill system, which allows SAO players to assign and level up different skills for combat and other purposes, independent of their main experience level, all the way up to level 1000. The way that skills are leveled up is pretty awful in itself. They gain levels as they're used, meaning that if you use one attack a lot, which would get really fucking boring, again, it'll get more powerful. And if you take a lot of damage, you'll heal faster. This is exactly how leveling stats works in Final Fantasy 2, and it is the fucking worst. In FF2, the only way to grind for more health is to go out into the 
the wilderness and take free hits from weak enemy monsters for hours on end. It fucking sucks. Nobody likes doing it, and it's a big part of why Final Fantasy II is considered by many to be the worst game in the entire series. The stats that level up based on XP are Strength and Agility, which players can allocate points to. His point about needing to do the exact same attack to increase its damage is wrong. We don't exactly know how much health levels up alongside the player without the use of the skill system. However, we do know that you have to upgrade equipment over time, being the bulk of damage absorption. Kirito's battle healing skill, which by the way he had to level up by keeping his health in the red for hours on end, which would fucking suck, is so fucking ridiculously overpowered that in episode 4, just 4 months into the game, he can heal faster than 5 mid-level players can hurt him. His comment on health regeneration would be correct, but if we are using Dark Souls as a metric as he suggests, there is no regen over time without the use of specific items and miracles. Items in SAO, again, being as accessible as they would be in real life, and arguably more accessible than in Dark Souls, due to being able to down your own bottle at your own pace. Jeff also uses the term mid-level player, despite saying that there is no level cap earlier. Kirito's battle healing skill, which by the way he had to level up by keeping his health in the red for hours on end, which would fucking suck, is so fucking ridiculously overpowered that in episode 4, just 4 months into the game, he can heal faster than 5 mid-level players can hurt him. Unique skills are perhaps the most broken thing about SAO, since they're procedurally generated. He brings up that No Man's Sky's procedural generations is bad, and because of this, every skill will be awful and samey, which is fallacious since this is science fiction. If we are going to assume that sending microwaves to somebody's brain at a very specific frequency will not give them cancer after blasting it to them over the course of two years, and also be able to give them specific sensations, then I don't think that good AI generations are out of the question in a science fiction future. And they wouldn't be used by the people who get them anyway. Any player skilled enough to earn a unique skill would just sell their character to the highest bidder. Look how much that fat guy was willing to pay Kirito for just the cosmetic appearance of his rare avatar in GGO. Imagine if that had any kind of actual gameplay benefit. I agree that PvP will be broken, but making something out to be the best skill or even a better skill neglects the fact that only one person will have that ability, so the full potential of a skill would not be likely to be seen by the majority of players. Fighting games are a good example of this, with people lowballing characters that we find later out are broken, or they end up highballing characters that are either mediocre or awful in the lifespan of the game. He argues that nobody would be willing to be a blacksmith to sell their stuff, but somebody would be willing to grind a character for a year to sell it before starting from level 0 on a brand new account. I think that the former is more likely, but then again, that's just his opinion versus mine. In a similar fashion to what they do with PvP arenas, most good MMO dungeons are instanced as well. This means that they take place separately from the main persistent game world, and player levels are changed to a base level so that the dungeon is always challenging. In SAO, you can just wander into a dungeon at any level, run up, and fight a boss. This means that, effectively, every boss encounter in SAO is like a world boss encounter in another MMO. And while world bosses can be fun to take on, the fact that you can roll up with as many players as you can fit into an area means that they're not very challenging at all. Earning bragging rights from a challenge is the single biggest motivating factor for most raid guilds and players, which is why server firsts are such a big deal in MMOs. But without a solid limit on player group size or level, every boss would be easy to cheese. With Roll up with as many players as you can fit into an arena. Again, the SAO wiki says that players can only interact with an enemy one at a time, so having a massive amount of players would be inefficient. On top of that, fitting in a massive amount of players when the physical space is being taken up and when lives are at stake is pretty risky to say the least. The whole thing about the raid bosses is kind of true, but then you would have to take into consideration the Minotaur fight, where there was a relatively small party who wanted to make a name for themselves by beating it without outside help. The quest for bragging rights will always exist, no matter what. Plus, grinding these raids for loot would be functionally impossible, since instead of creating a new instance, you would have to wait for the boss to respawn every single time you want to fight it, all while other player groups are trying to do the same thing. And don't even get me started on the last hit system for getting the best drops. By rewarding players for getting the last hit, the game explicitly discourages cooperation. Not that it doesn't do that in other worse ways. The whole entire thing of waiting for a boss to respawn doesn't take into account that various players would want to take gears from bosses on different floors than some other players. Not to mention the fact that he said that there are two years worth of content in 75 floors, and we are actively shown that there is more than one boss for every floor. It also assumes that there wouldn't be more servers made for the game if it were to grow bigger and bigger. 
The last hit system for gear doesn't matter all too much outside of a death game or if the players aren't in the same guild. The show never states that XP is divided evenly. It's easy to assume that Kirito on his own would be able to grind at his own pace without bothering other people. Theoretically, he could grind over 14 hours per day. Whereas, being in a guild would mean that you work on entirely different time schedules as each other, not to mention the amount of hours you work might be more or less than other guild members. His point about XP would have been a lot more effective had Kirito actually cleared out an entire dungeon by himself. However, we see something contrary to that, with him almost dying against the Minotaur with the help of Asuna and an entire guild. How did nobody on the dev team figure out that the game is supposed to kill people? I mean, you can poison food. There's no function for that mechanic if the game is operating normally. It only makes sense in some sort of long-term survival scenario where players need to eat and are actively trading food with each other. Otherwise, they just cook whatever gives them the buffs that they need themselves and not worry about the taste because they can eat real food in the real world. The poison is likely something that is just applicable to every item instead of just food. In fact, we see that poison can be applied to weapons. The question here from a game design perspective is not why you can poison food, it's why would you not be able to poison food. The game emphasizes immersion, so why would putting a liquid on an item affect that item? while at the same time not affecting others. Also, cooking items give buffs. Cooking is a subclass that a players would have to dedicate resources to, so not everyone would be able to cook something that gives necessary buffs. Moreover, Jeff stated earlier that there is no support class, which, though is true in the more traditional sense, this segment about foods, poison, buffs, and debuffs shows that support does exist to an extent, albeit limited to item-creating subclasses. His point about eating real food in the real world is extremely fallacious when you take into account that tomahawks cost insane amounts of money, as do various ingredients like truffles. Not to mention that there are creatures that taste entirely differently than animals do in our world, such as the rabbit that Kirito eats, giving players the prospect of eating something like mermaid tail sushi. Throughout the boring samey dungeons, players can encounter anti-crystal zones that negate the use of crystals entirely. In these areas, it's impossible to escape the dungeon or even heal your fellow players. But detach yourself from the gripping drama for a moment and think of what it would be like to actually play that. You're wandering around a shitty, bland dungeon with no personality and no apparent backstory. You wander into what seems like a normal treasure room with zero signposting as to potential danger, and as a punishment for doing what basically any player would do in that situation, your whole party is wiped and you have to start the entire fucking dungeon over. And the way that it's wiped is the most frustrating part. Not only are you ambushed, you're caught in a trap that both prevents you from escaping and shuts down about half of your strategic options. I hate it when games do this. Boss fights are meant to be tests of your game knowledge, not the degree to which you're willing to grind. If you're going to totally shut down abilities that are otherwise viable, like how SMT games routinely make bosses immune to all status effects, then you may as well make players fight the boss in a totally different battle system for all the relevance it has to what they've been doing up to this point. The traps honestly don't seem that bad to me. If you find a place suspicious looking, then you ought to try to use your crystal to check whether a room is anti-crystal or not. It's shown that message crystals exist, and it's safe to assume that they won't work in an anti-crystal zone. So it would be wise for players to have a message crystal out that says a safe word that they can activate any time they walk into a dungeon room that they find suspicious. On top of that, how many times do you see an easily accessible treasure chest without enemies? You're kinda retarded if you fall for that, or if you don't adequately prepare for a raid boss which you know can potentially have these crystal inhibiting walls. Another instance of poor writing, but not quite poor game design. ALO operates on a PvP faction system like many other MMOs. Every faction has their own territory, and all are working toward the goal of being the first to reach the top of the world tree. Whichever faction makes it to the top of the tree first will supposedly be given unlimited flying power. Now, a lot's been made of how stupid this incentive is. It renders every other faction effectively unplayable once the conflict is resolved, and ensures that no new player will ever pick a starting faction aside from that winner. But it's also a lie on the part of the developers, so I'll let it slide. Though the book was written before a lot of MMOs were accessible to Japan, there have been multiple instances in which this had happened, and the solution was a world reset after a certain amount of time. Where most other faction-based MMOs have two or three factions at most, ALO has nine. This would be crazy and untenable enough on its own, having up to nine teams in one battle is way too much to keep track of and build a meaningful strategy around, and at that point you may as well be playing a free-for-all deathmatch, but the problem is compounded by the nature of these factions. See, ALO's factions are divided up by race, and your choice of race isn't just a cosmetic decision. Every race has unique traits that are specialized to the point that they may as well be classes in their own right, and these unique traits are not balanced at all. Kate Sith, for example, are the beast tamer race and have improved eyesight. 
Compare that to salamanders, who have the highest attack of any race in the game and can use fire magic. Wizards of the Coast stole advice from this man for 6C. Racial bonuses exist in Elder Scrolls Online, not to mention the most basic of RPGs. It's insane to me that he was complaining about how boring the lack of variety was a minute ago, but now that the game presents a clear-cut path to subclass with skills available at the start, it's somehow a problem. Having good senses in a game that is sensory-based is very important. There's an obvious sneak attack bonus at night, but being able to hear, smell, and see things from a great distance will be very good in a defensive and offensive scenario. They don't have the best attack in the game, which would incentivize them to form an alliance with a faction that either has a comparable attack bonus or a higher defense bonus. It's because these races have gaps in ability with each other that makes it interesting, because it incentivizes factions to work together. Something which happens in the show. Or leprechauns, who are described as the blacksmith race. Consider the implications of that. Imagine if only the Horde in WoW had access to crafted weapons and gear. Do you have any idea how fucking broken that would be? He could have had a decent point with the blacksmith thing if he were, you know, right about it. Again, it's a racial bonus. It isn't the end-all be-all. Somebody of a different race can still be a blacksmith. They just won't be nearly as good despite putting in the exact same amount of time. The race would probably have the best gear in the game since they are the only race capable of having a proficiency above the skill cap, but it wouldn't be an entire monopoly. The Undyne and Puka races have it worst of all since they're both geared entirely towards support skills. They're stuck playing healers and buffers, fighting against classes that are explicitly built for DPS. Being an Undyne is like being forced to play Overwatch as Mercy and only Mercy forever, and only being able to form teams with other Mercies. At this point, it's very obvious that the only competitive game that he's ever played is Overwatch, and he got really pissy about having to play support. I don't exactly understand why he's complaining about this now. He was complaining earlier that there wasn't a support in SAO, but in ALO, there's not only one, but two support classes. Why would that be a bad thing? Unless he had never played an RPG before and didn't have to dedicate a long amount of time into a build. And yes, they do change how things work at the end of the first season, but we're supposed to believe that this unplayably broken game has survived and thrived in this state for over a year prior to Kirito picking it up. I call bullshit. Nobody would still be playing this game after all that time. In fact, I doubt that anybody would be playing after one month. He had made multiple comments in the videos that have these fallacies in them, but I think now's as good a time as any to bring them up. People play shitty games, even if there's no alternative, such as ALO being the only full-dive MMORPG that won't trap your body. People even play worse version of games due to the player base being a lot bigger than their supposed better games. Look no further than COD, Type Lumina, Strive, Valorant, Galo Infinite. Especially not with how character creation works. Your appearance is randomly generated when you start, and you have to pay real money to change it. Yet somehow, of course, Kirito gets a character who looks exactly like himself, as does Asuna, and Leafa and a lot of the other characters get really appealing characters. I'm relatively fine with him complaining about ALO's lack of customization, but to play Devil's Advocate, SAO also made the in-game models look like how the people are supposed to look like in real life. Not to mention files carried over from SAO, such as Yui, meaning it wouldn't be that far of a stretch to assume the old character models also carried over with Asuna being the most obvious. GGO is an entirely different story with a spin-off in the P90 bitch. But one point he makes that's particularly relevant to this argument is that this kind of shift in the meta would likely lead to everyone quitting the game. And on this point, I think Digi is wrong. Now, considering that it takes eight months to bring one new character up to a competitive level, effectively making it impossible to grind up alts while still acquiring new gear to keep your main account competitive, I can definitely see a lot of people rage quitting over this, but only if there were any people playing in the first place. The issue here is that it's some asshole saying something about a game instead of verifiable patch notes. The worst part of GGO is that stat exist in the first place. If they didn't shift the meta, that would mean nothing, since you can just get a different loadout. I did state that I see this as a problem for people who want to play competitively. However, it is still an MMORPG. WoW has tournaments in spite of there being a leveling system, and the most compelling thing about that game being raids. People play games because they find a unique sense of value in them. Seriously, just look at the Gungale online wiki. Only four of the six stats even have descriptions. Dexterity's main function, shrinking your aiming reticule, overlaps with agility, which also reduces recoil, boosts your evasive ability, and makes you run faster. Unless you're as into traps as Fred, there's no reason to put even a single point into dexterity, or any other stat for that matter, since vitality only boosts your health, and strength only affects your carrying capacity and equipment choices to a small degree. The show tells us that strength is better, but a high-weight weapon would need to be completely fucking broken to negate the inherent tactical advantage 
advantage of being able to run faster and aim more accurately than other players. And the two stats without descriptions are just plain ridiculous. Luck is the filler stat to end all filler stats, the thing that people put in when they can't think of anything else, especially in a game that's meant to be skill-based and therefore have no probability mechanics. And sensibility... Sensibility? What the fuck does that even mean? So there are a couple things to unpack about this. One, he's using the wiki, so some of the information which he hides is harder to excuse as not malicious. Two, this feeds into SAO's lack of world building, but it's not like we can't assume what the stats do from how they work in other games. Luck would likely increase the amount of money and drop chance, being a good stat to spec into early game to get necessary gear at a brisker pace. Instead of sacrificing your hard-earned cash, you're going to be sacrificing a lot of levels later on that could have been dedicated to an entirely different stat prior to the hard cap being reached. In addition, the game is an MMORPG first and comp shooter second, which means that critical hits are still possible, not taking into account mechanics such as bloody mess in Fallout and bleed in Dark Souls. Sensibility being used as a term to describe a stat is rather intuitive to me. It enhances your sense or perception of things you are sensing, sort of how an accessibility feature works, amplifying noises, smells, pains, and color contrast between players and environments. There are a few other uses that can be implemented, such as it being a stand-in for perception in D&D, with being able to tell what a gun can do from looking at it, or having an auto-tracker for the amount of ammunition, which would emphasize the more gamey RPG elements. Dexterity would reduce the spray away from a crosshair, whereas AGI would reduce how much the body would feel the recoil and how much the crosshair would move. This is not an overlap. Otherwise, tap firing and spray control might as well be the exact same thing. He implies that Engineer and Torbjorn are useless, not to mention the effectiveness of good old-fashioned Claymore, C4, or Grenade with a string. The show tells us that strength is better, but a high-weight weapon would need to be completely fucking broken to negate the inherent tactical advantage of being able to run faster and aim more accurately than other players. He's finally walking back on his retarded comment about not needing a better headshot percentage, but again, this fucks over everything he says about fast main characters being horrible writing. But even that ignores the fundamental problem that this game shouldn't have stats in the first place. Competitive shooters, by their very nature, need to put players on even ground. There are competitive shooters with progression systems, but all of the ones that people actually play focus on giving you new equipment options that are more or less balanced against the starting gear. It would be stupid to create a huge gap in basic functionality between new and veteran players because it would discourage new players from ever trying to learn the game in the first place. Follow-up shots being easier due to lack of recoil would make for a better stat than strength. If the spread wasn't all over the place, and he stated a weapon that actually gets follow-up shots instead of a bolt-action sniper rifle, you would want to spec into decks for every single class in the world unless you're running an LMG or SMG, and I'm very iffy about the former because of how important tracking would be. I agree with his next point about stats having no reason to exist when spray reduction will be astronomically worse for new players and people not having access to the same weapons being an issue in a comp shooter. However, I'm going to call back to what he said about headshot percentages in the beginning of the video. In a shooter, knowing where everything is on the map and figuring out where your enemy will go next is the key to victory, not improving your headshot accuracy. I'm not saying I disagree with his current point, I'm just saying that he absolutely does. Customizable stats create even more problems at high levels. There are two possible scenarios here. Either one stat is so obviously overpowered that nothing else even matters and everyone has the same build, or all of the stats are roughly equal and balanced and it becomes impossible to tell at a glance what an enemy will be capable of. Imagine a version of Overwatch where Soldier 76 could be as fast as Lucio or have as much health as Roadhog and every different build looks exactly the same. Or a version of TF2 where Spies and Heavies have the same character model. It would be a disaster. The entire competitive balance of these games is predicated on the idea that you can tell at a glance how many bullets you need to kill an enemy and how hard it will be to hit them in the first place. It would be roughly impossible to tell at a glance what somebody's build is. He also uses Overwatch and TF2 as examples, despite hero shooters having no economy that affects the gameplay, and the fact that if you take a look back, he uses CSGO footage, a game which most people can have snipers and SMGs, despite characters having the exact same model. He's the one who asserted that games knowledge is way more important than just being able to shoot good. So being able to intuit what a weapon would be able to do, instead of just knowing what it would be able to do, is just completely irrelevant. Regardless, I fail to see an instance in which a top player wouldn't be able to identify a specific firearm. The only instance in which that can be the case is if somebody was doing a strength build and they had multiple rifles and weapons on them, so it's hard to decipher which one that they are going to use as their primary. It's almost like the win conditions are going to be the same irrespective of others' weapons and mostly in respect to your own. 
Needing to know how many hits an enemy is from death is irrelevant, unless it is a team-based game in which you can call out someone who is lit up in a specific location, which GGO is not, since TDM is the only game mode which we see competitively. This is something important, because shoot to kill is something that should always be implemented in a free-for-all shooter. His point about starting and ending gear being balanced is absolutely stupid at worst, and absolutely baffling at best. In an MMORPG, you would want to see an improvement in the gear you get. For a more traditional comp shooter in CS, you would want your investment in saving up your money throughout the rounds to not be in vain, and you would want to get better gear for spending way more money than the enemy team is. If it were not the case that a lot of later game weapons are better, then you would see a lot more people just buying util and body armor and nothing else. In a game where you know where almost every attack is coming from in advance, being able to score sneak attacks is a total game changer. Yet somehow these are the least used weapons in the game, because in addition to not grasping how video games work or how players play them, Reki Kawahara doesn't even understand the system that he designed. How is it that nobody until Kirito thought to test if laser swords could deflect bullets? How is it that Sinon is basically the only sniper in the whole game? The only explanation given by Kawahara is that these weapons are harder to use, but that makes it more likely that hardcore players would gravitate toward them. Winning with a weapon that has a high skill floor is a huge mark of prestige, and pro gamers are always looking for ways to increase their advantages over opponents in even tiny ways. I think that bullet predictions are stupid since it gives players accurate information about shot placement that their enemy doesn't know despite being the ones who to fire the damn thing. However, there's a certain range in which bullets stop showing, and it incentivizes players to have LMGs. However, there is a range in which they stop showing, incentivizing players to have a massive amount of suppressive fire. It doesn't matter if you know where a shot is going to hit. If you're not going to be able to get out of the way to avoid the shot, you are going to get hit and take damage. I know it's an absolute cop-out to say, but the only reason why somebody isn't being Luke Skywalker in GGO is because Kirito is just that fast, and he's the only one who can consistently deflect a massive amount of bullets. The only way you can argue otherwise is if you go along with this false premise that the higher end of gaming is based more on knowledge and less on individual performance. I agree that a lot more people would be using sniper rifles, but again, it's a flaw of the show not showing enough people there. Regardless, due to how crosshairs work, only players who have grinded their crosshair can use snipers consistently, whereas more bullets would always translate to more chances for damaging the enemy, irrespective of weapon spread. The weapon in the MMORPG setting is also rather low reward in comparison to other rifles, taking into account that somebody can loot your kill before you're able to get to it in the overworld. I said that the AWP is one of the best weapons in CS since it's a one-hit kill, but people would say that the AK is better overall since it allows for more follow-up shots and kills an armored enemy on a headshot, making it lower risk with a comparable reward. In other words, unless players are in a situation in which they can eliminate the amount of time it takes to pull back a bolt, or they are in PvP in which they have the same amount of enemies as allies in addition to themselves, the majority of snipers will not last an entire tournament. On top of that, unless the deck stat is leveled up insanely high, there will be a spread on it that the op doesn't have making follow-up shots more important and snipers less consistently good. Missing a single shot with the AK isn't that big a deal. You still have 29 rounds left before you have to reload. A sniper rifle gives you a fewer amount of rounds before you have to reload, not to mention the amount of time it takes back to pull the bolt and the fact that your location is given to everybody. Supposedly, Mother's Basement has more comp experience than Reki Kawahara, despite not knowing that snipers are typically better in team scenarios, giving off the impression that he got dominated by a sniper in the only FPS that he ever played. To bring up speculation on the gaps in world buildings, we don't see how ACOGs work, meaning that they can be on an even playing field, if not a better alternative to using sniper rifles. Kawahara fails to understand video games and gamers on a fundamental level. The clowns who wrote the Second Life hoverboard chase into CSI New York have a better grasp on the subject matter than he does. You couldn't pay me to play any of the games that Kawahara has created, and GGO actually does try to pay you to play it, which opens up a whole new range of questions as to how it could be economically viable or even legal, but that's a discussion for another day. The game is stated to be a money laundering scheme, so legality is out of the question in terms of concern. Nevertheless, online tournaments do take place and are economically viable. One of the only games that he's ever played on this list of games that he brings up to compare SAO to is Overwatch, which pays its players by having sponsorships and making money off of loot box transactions. For GGO, there's a currency to get more items and cosmetics, which can be translated into hard cash, as well as the weapons necessary for combat that somebody would otherwise need to grind months to get, as he states. Roblox has a system in which creators convert the purchasable currency into cash, but it's not a one-to-one, -one, with the company taking a cut for server hosting and roofs over their head. It's not likely that GGO has this, otherwise it would be filled with people treating it just like a stalker market. 
I'd like to reiterate that I don't have that strong of a connection to SAO. I respect people like Scamboli and others who fell for the hype and still find value in it that I never got. But I would never argue that the animation is bad, the music is bad, the voice acting is bad, or the background art is bad. I would rather not wage unearned criticisms to any of the things that I find serviceable or passable, because when the things of value and passion come on screen, they will be perceived as nothing but forgettable.